most women start a business? Is it passion, money, or freedom? Welcome to Female Founders, the podcast that takes you behind the scene with women who are founders and CEOs to help you start and scale a successful business of your own. I am your host, Nagelia de Ravine. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Female Founders. In this episode, we are going to have a conversation with Nicole Anderson. She is an HR entrepreneur and founder of Med HR Solutions. With a mission to change the industry and guide today's corporate leaders to understand tomorrow's workforce better. Good morning, Nicole. Um, you know, reading about you, it's uh, fascinating because from being a senior human resources resource executive for more than a decade uh, to guiding companies with building their main power, you have been a source of inspiration for many. And um, I'm glad to actually have this conversation with you. And um, I'm also excited to know more about you and amazing work that you have been doing in the HR sector. Now, before you become your own boss, you held corporate leadership position across different um, industries. Can you tell us more about your experience as a leader and executive? So I started my career in a private prison, actually. Um, people find wow. that pretty hard to believe sometimes. Um, so I, I started really low as an HR clerk. And over the years, I worked my way up to um, uh, in the retail industry, in the manufacturing industry. And then um, I moved on to more corporate level positions in legal um, and uh, legal and foreclosure and those type of corporate roles. I um, just increased my knowledge in those areas. But how was the experience starting your position in a prison? How was that experience for you? Well, um, at first it was difficult. Um, my whole family was in um, corrections. Uh, my dad was had been with the state, of, the state of Florida as a correctional officer for many years. My mom was a correctional nurse. Uh, and then my brother went into the business and he... It, he was a captain. And mm. so I knew a little bit about going into the prison, but going into it from an HR business perspective was way different. Um, it was tough. Uh, I had to, um, you know, you have correctional officers that are in a tough environment all the time. Um, you have inmates that are in a tough environment as well. And here they are, like you're mixing the two together. And there was, there was always some issues. It was definitely a learning experience. Um, one of the things that I can say that I took away from that position uh, was a thick skin. Um, hmm. Was being able to handle the um, things that kept coming my way and uh, be able to take, you know, and handle situations that were high stress and, you know, narrow them down to where we can take emotions out of it and uh, be able to handle the situation properly for everybody. I think I get the picture when you, you know, especially in corporate, it can be a little bit tough. So it's kind of like when you get, when you get to those other, you know, big companies, you're working for them, it's like, you have no idea. I can handle this. It's okay. I've been worse than that. So I think I, I like the fact that you, you use that experience to actually grow yourself and better and better and better and to eventually starting your own. But how and why did you uh, make that transition from corporate to starting your own business? I, I didn't like where I was seeing things go in the business world. Um, I, I, I didn't like the archaicness of HR. Um, where everyone was just stuck in this repetitive HR policy procedure. Mm. Um, it was basically like you're not, uh, like they take your opinion and your advice, but only to an extent. And then they, they feel like you don't have enough business sense or business acumen to be able to make full on decisions that affect the workplace. And I just, I felt that that was incorrect. I, I felt like, um, aside from the business aspect, I felt like HR hasn't been moving in any direction. It doesn't keep up with the 21st century. 
Uh, we are not adequate. Human resources is not adequate business partners within an organization. Um, and so I wanted to find a way to mix the two. And I knew um, at the downturn of the last company that I worked with, I knew it was coming. Like I knew I had seen the writing on the wall. You know, we had done quite a few layoffs. I, I knew that um, if you're you know, can count numbers, you know that if you're losing this amount of people, you're probably going to be next, even in as an HR role. And so eventually that happened, but I had already started building my business. I knew that I wanted to be a different type of HR. Um, I wanted to take an entrepreneurial um, look at human resources and go into organizations and teach them about their options, that it's not black and white. Um, that human resources is not black and white. There's many different options to handle different situations. Um, and there is some risk involved. There's always risk. So I just combined the entrepreneurial spirit that I have with human resources and started my business. Bada boom, bada bum, here you are making it, <laughs> making it as successful. <laughs> yes. I love that. <laughs> You know, I, I love hearing that because a lot of uh, as women, sometimes we get stuck into this position that we feel like we need to stay there because we are secure with that paycheck coming in, right? We don't want to take that risk. But again, even when you stay with that paycheck, you're still taking a risk because you don't know if, if you're going to have a job tomorrow morning when you, you know, so you might get fired. Um, why not just try and something women, on your own? I tell women all the time, I say that we're all expendable. Like, Yes. A 100% that, you know, if something happened to us tomorrow, they would just replace us. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So you founded Men H Hustle on Solutions and also uh, Men Recruiting. Can you throw more light on the two companies and the services that they offer? So Men HR Solutions um, obviously has morphed, uh, which most businesses do. They kind of, um, you start off one way and then you go a completely different direction as um, your business grows and as you get more, you become more of an expert in your field. And uh, Men to HR, we, uh, we started it as we were going to pull all the companies, get all as many companies as we could to become, to become their full-time HR department. Uh, and so that's how we started. We were uh, remote HR prior to COVID. So we had, uh, <laughs> it was definitely, yeah, it was definitely not um, a trend at the time to have HR as a remote person that everybody felt like HR needed to be on site. So it was pretty difficult in the beginning. But as our business transitioned, we transitioned to doing projects and HR work. And we have really gone in now, we go into most companies and we just completely dismantle um, their human resources department uh, from top to bottom and we rebuild it from the ground up. Um, so that's the projects that we have really been focusing on. And that's what people bring us in for at this point. Um, we still do some HR um some day-to-day -day HR for some of our clients. And we do uh, quite a bit of projects related to payroll implementations, uh, benefit implementations, benefit renewals. Uh, we, we do those services, but with companies wanting to go a different route in their, um, in their company to make their company successful and sustainable for years to come, they bring us in to really take down their HR department and rebuild it um, with the entrepreneur mindset. And, um, and that's what we're doing. And it's been super successful. Um, our company, our clients love it. They love um, that we're training the HR individuals to think outside the box, um, to not think so much in that narrow minded. Um, one of the other things we did post COVID or well, actually during COVID was open another business. Um, which a lot of a lot of people were not uh, were not opening businesses during They're COVID. Closing. But <laughs> <laughs> they were closing. Uh, we opened Mend Recruiting, and now um, along with our HR firm, we are also a full service recruiting firm where we do high level uh, headhunting recruiting. We also do um, hourly 
recruiting, uh, large projects, growth projects, any type of recruiting. We don't do staffing. We stay away from temp and staff. It's definitely direct placement. And uh, one of the great things about us recruiting is that we're an HR firm that is recruiting. So our main sure. goal, our main goal is retention and making sure that you are able to retain the employees that you have um, and the employees that we're recruiting for you. So um, the clients that come on board, we, we love our consultative approach to recruiting, redoing their job descriptions. If the interview process is not going very smooth, we will give them some consultative advice. Like this is what you need to do to make these interviews successful. Uh, we've had, you've had a lot of turnover in this department. We need to look at some things that you're doing. So uh, we have very unique recruiting perspective um, being that we are an HR firm as well. You, you, you like the full package. And then I love the fact that when you come, when you come in, you clean the house, you make sure everything is clean from, top to bottom. So it's in its perfection. So when we bring anyone else and the whole team can just get along properly the way it's supposed to. 100%. And I want HR, I want HR to have this seat at the table. I want them to be able to help a company grow. Um, I've been in industries and I've, I've seen so many HR departments that actually hinder the growth of um, their organization. Uh, because of just this mentality that that's exa that's all HR is there for. And, um, and I just feel like it's a wasted position if we're not helping in the growth of our organizations. I couldn't agree more. You are, you're absolutely correct. And, and you're right too. HR has, that's been years. It's always the same thing. Always the same thing. I don't know why everything else changed. Why do you keep the, each on an exact same spot. Why? It, especially right. even school change. A lot of things change in this world. When you go to school for an H, as an HR, it's like, I'm pretty sure the things you learned 20 years ago, you're not learning it today. It's completely like a different way of learning. So who knows? I wonder why corporate leave it like that. I've, it's easy. You know what I mean? <laughs> change is hard. Change is difficult. So it's just easy to leave you know, it's HR. Let's just leave it alone. Um, and for me, I, I look at it as, okay, I, I use an example as a dress code policy. So um, we're in the 21st century and um, we were always told that um, you're going to perform the way you dress. That was always, so HR became the, the, the keeper and the police of a policing dress code. And it's like, there's way more important things that we need to be focusing on than dress code. And also, um, if you have core values that are, that have innovation or creativity on it, but you're requiring your staff to come in in business suits, where, how are you promoting your core values? How are you, how are you promoting innovation and creativity? And these are the things that uh, the, I mean, that's just a little example because the dress code's easy because almost every location, every company has a dress code. So that one's easy. But how are you going to be an innovator in your industry if you're still making your employees come to work in a suit um, or business attire when they're not meeting with clients? They're not going out there. They're not your salespeople, but they're in working and you want creativity a dress code is the first place that you would have creativity. Why can't they have red hair? You know, so it's just, it's those things that we're, we're so caught up on at the corporate level that an image that, and even HR people, I mean, HR is not the most friendly department. We can all agree to that. Yes. Um, <laughs> most employees will tell you, I don't like my HR department. Um, and it's because of things like that, like we're policing dress code. Um, and I just felt like I didn't go to school to police dress code. That's not what I got no. my education for. Absolutely not. But you know, you, 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 you some great points here. One thing that, um, I felt like, how do you think that HR can, uh, 
bring more to the table for a business, more than just being on the dress code, more than just doing the firing, more than just uh, telling people what you're doing is bad, this is your last notice, or I'm gonna have to fire you next time, being the bad guy. Because like you said, I work for corporate, uh, uh, um, working in corporate, that was also always like, if you don't be careful, you're gonna get fired and HR is in your ass. <laughs> I used to say that a lot. Yes, 100%. And, so what are the other ways that HR people can actually bring value to that organization than just being that firing, that bad guy behind the scene? It's taking a step out of their comfort zone. I, hmm. I, that, is, that is the biggest thing that I see. Um, it's, easy to be, it's easy to be the bad guy if, if you have everything backing you. You have the legal system backing you. You have uh, case law backing you, you have policy backing you. It's really easy to just stay in that comfort zone. When you, sure. when they, when anybody, we all know this, whether, it, I mean, you don't have to be in HR, you can be stepping out for a business or doing something new in your personal life, a new hobby. Stepping out of your comfort zone is the hardest part. And a lot of people who are in HR are not confident in their business knowledge. Because they're so you business is so fluid. Um, one month you're up, one month you're down. You know, you could have layoffs in two months. You could be mass hiring. I mean, business is just so fluid. And when when you stay stagnant in HR, there's no risk. There's no risk in HR uh, because, like I said, you have all these things backing you that says you're able to do what you want. You're able to do this because the law is breaking it up or the law is backing you up. So I think that in order to get individuals to do that, it's stepping out of your comfort zone. And one of the things I teach is, and I know this sounds so weird, but when I was little, my grandmother used to, uh, I would sit on her lap and we would read the magazine. And, or we would read a magazine. She used to get all these magazines. And she would always start in the back of the magazine. Huh. It's the only thing she started in the back of the magazine. And I was like, well, that's not what they teach us in school. I was like, why do you start in the back of the magazine? She said, because all the good stuff's in the back. <laughs> that's what she really? said. She's like, she said, the com she said, the magazine companies will put all this garbage in the front to get you... Um, to get you sold on all the ads and you have to go through the ads, you have to go through all of these things. And then all the good articles are always in the back. She's like, so I don't want to huh. see any of this. She's like, I want to see all the good stuff. I want to read the articles. I want to read the good articles. I want all of the good information. So she would always start in the back of the magazine. Now, if you give that to any other person, they're like, oh, that's, there's no way that I'm going to do that. So one of the things I do to train new HR people is I get them magazines and I tell them they need to start in the back. <laughs> because they're not comfortable I doing love it. that. They're not comfortable doing it. They, uh, it's out of the norm. It is weird because we've been taught to mm -hmm. do it this way our entire lives, to read books from left to right. Um, and so... That's the, that's the first task I give them is I want you to read these magazines from the back to the front. And I want you to do it until you're wow. comfortable, until it makes no difference. And so teaching, so that's like one of my first things that I do for my, um, for anybody that I'm training to step out of their comfort zone. Young entrepreneurs that I mentor, I'll give them the same task. I'll say, I need you to read um, I need you to read this magazine from the back and everybody looks at me like I'm crazy, but you're so comfortable doing things a certain way that even reading a magazine from the back to the front makes you feel strange. Okay. Yeah. So that's the first thing, um, that HR people have to do to be able to have that seat at the table is they have to step out of their comfort, comfort zone, learn things that they didn't learn in school. Um, they have to learn the business like inside and out. When I was, when I was a, when I was HR for companies, um, as a W2 employee, 
I would go sit on the floor with all of the employees with the job, like the different departments and the jobs. And I would sit yeah. and I would learn their role, what they're doing, how this works. Like you can't, because one of the things we do in HR is we make decisions in HR and not, and don't know how it affects everybody else. Also, we make decisions because the, the CEO or the president says, hey, I need this done, but I'm not able to provide advice on why that's not good because I don't, I don't know anything about the business. So I would take one day a week, every week, and I would go sit with a new employee and learn their job so that I knew how one thing affected the other. And that's, an, that's a comfort zone thing. But once you start learning that information, you're able to be more of a business partner with the, org with the leaders of the organization because you can, you can step out of your comfort zone. You can be confident in what you're saying. You can say, hey, this policy doesn't just affect this department. It's going to affect this department, and this is why. Wow. So now you're giving your, your organization, you're giving them options instead of your black and white no, we can't do it because of this. Exactly. Wow, that's a great point. You know, I think that if, if every HR person looked at it that way, it would make a huge difference on everyone's life to able to be able to not look like you're the bad guy, but you also, well, actually, you're not the bad guy, really. You're just following what the company policy said and what they told you to do. At the end of the day, you're just doing your right. job, but everybody else just look at you the other way. But I like your uh, your way of look at it. It's it's a bit different, and it also uh, can make a huge change in uh, in the industry itself. So, um, did you face any challenges while starting off, and how did you uh, navigate that to actually uh, during the especially during the pandemic? So, uh, definitely. Um, I think I I tell people all the time. I think if I went back, I don't know that I would do it again. Um, because they were just <laughs> like, that's, I, but I, I absolutely love what I do and I love being an entrepreneur and a business owner. So, um, my, some of my early challenges was definitely capital. I was starting, um, I was starting a business with very little capital. Um, and I had gotten laid off. Um, I had planned on staying with my company for another year prior to um, going full time in my company. And um, I got laid off sooner than I thought was gonna happen. Um, so I had to jump in, I had to dive in cause I have, I have, a, I have a daughter. So at the time she was um, 11, 10, 11 years old. Um, so I had to make sure that I was able to provide for her. Um, so I just dove right in and I started just hustling. And um, the challenges of winning clients, losing clients, um, start managing people in a different level. Like you're now looking at, okay, we need to bring in money. Like we need revenue. Um, if you can't bring in revenue, I'm going to let you go because I can't, I can't afford a position that's not bringing in. So the different aspects of being able to, uh, to navigate now, all right, I'm a business owner. I've got to pay taxes now. Uh, you, that was always handled for me. I've got to do audits and accounting. I was taking on all these tasks that I always had people around me that were doing. So those were definitely a challenge. Um, COVID provided us with quite a bit of stress as it did for everyone. Uh, for us, uh, COVID, we lost a couple clients because they had to close their doors permanently. Um, and so that was unfortunate. It was very stressful. Uh, that's why we pivoted, um, and started the, um, started the recruiting firm, uh, because recruiting had started picking up in the market. So we picked it up and started doing it and it's been super successful. Uh, the one thing that I can say for anybody that's going to start a business or wanting to become an entrepreneur would be, you need a therapist. Um, <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> you definitely do uh you need you need a confidant you need somebody that you can talk to uh because you can't go tell your other staff about this person you know you can't go tell your staff like oh this client is being this way 
uh, you know, we're going to lose this client because then your employees become fearful of their jobs mm-hmm. and then they jump ship. So there, there's a lot of things. So a therapist can't tell your business. <laughs> so, That's true. And they can also provide, they can also provide really great advice at handling your own stress and how you manage and handle people. So I always tell everybody, you know, get a therapist. <laughs> get some help first because you're going to yes, need it. Get some help first. Yes. I completely agree with you on that. But uh, one thing that um, I'm missing is um, your services. Do you focus just in corporate, but also small businesses? Yes, we do. Uh, We actually, a lot of our clients are small business. Uh, They are uh, growth. They're in their growth phases. So they need our help and our assistance um, to grow to that next stage. I always recommend that even if you have one employee, you need to start looking at your HR roles and your handbooks Hmm. and things like that. Different states have different laws when it comes to what you need when. Um, And it goes down also to the city level and county level. Some of them have ordinances that say you, this is a problem after five employees, or this is a problem at before five employees. And a lot of business owners, especially small business owners, don't know that. Um, And an example of that in Palm Beach County, where I live, uh, and Broward and Miami Dade, they have a uh, ordinance of five pe- five employees or more can sue you for e- EEOC claims of discrimination, sexual harassment, um, age, things like that. Where federally it's fifteen or more, hmm. but it's a county ordinance, so it would be in the county, but they can still bring up suit towards you. Um, And that's a risk you need to mitigate because it's easy to mitigate that risk by just providing your leadership with some training, um, getting a handbook and a a process in place for how to handle complaints and things like that. But uh, so we love small businesses that are growing um, so that we can help guide them, you know, into because things happen at five employees, things happen at 15 employees, things happen at 25 employees, things happen at 50 employees and above. There's different things federally and statewide that we have to focus on. I I, I have to say I love uh, your focus because you are protecting your, your clients, you know, you're not just coming in to, uh do one to three, but you are also focusing what can actually get them in trouble in the next five to 10 years to come. Oh yeah, definitely. So now there's something very interesting I learned about you. Um, well, it's not really about you, but it is about you because you don't want to, you wrote it. Your first book, <laughs> HR is sexy. Huh? The name itself kind of like, Okay, now I want to know how HR is sexy. I have to buy this book. So this is interesting. (laughs) So how did the idea come to you, especially the name? So um, it actually wasn't the first name that I had for (laughs) my book. Um, It was, so I always knew that I needed to write a book. Um, Because in the business world, if you're a public speaker, if you're all these things, you um you have to have some credibility behind your name like how are you 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 have to people have to see you as an industry expert and industry leader or they're just not they're just going to keep walking so it took about two years to get the book into work into the works and it was kind of my philosophy on where i see hr going in the future or where it needs to be in the future And so it's really targeted towards um, HR leaders and business owners, entrepreneurs. It's set up in sections. So if something doesn't apply, you can read just one section of the book and not have to read the other section. So it starts with leadership in HR. Then it goes into a hiring culture, which is what I speak on a lot is about building a hiring culture. Um, I speak a lot nationally on that topic. And then um, the last one is the employees. The last section is, you know, what do we do with our employees now? So the idea came to be able to provide a resource for people, for for these business owners and these HR people to look at how can we do things differently? How can we focus differently? And um, 
the book, I don't even honestly remember what the first name of the book was because <laughs> I just, I like, I got rid of it and I was like, HR is sexy, but I was actually in a, one of the women's groups um, that I was a part of. I actually would, um, I was in a meeting with them and they were just, they knew that I was writing a book. So they wanted to talk about it. So we talked about it during this class and or this meeting and everybody started throwing out ideas and they're like well it's got to be catchy and it's got to be kind of an oxymoron type thing for people to get interested in and so it just we worked it out until it came up to hr is sexy um because you first of all saying sexy in the workplace is probably you know like a taboo mm -hmm. term to use so people are going to see HR and sexy together. They're gonna be like, well, this is makes me curious. So they're at least going to pick it up and look at the back of it and see what it's about. Um, but then I wanted to identify what it was about and it's revolutionizing human resources. Um, so that's why we did HR is sexy, revolutionizing human resources. And when readers read my book, um, they'll get a new perspective or a new idea on how they can turn their HR departments around. Uh, we're about to release a workbook for it um, yeah. so that uh, it'll be a free workbook that'll go along with the purchase of the book. Um, and this workbook will help take you through steps on what you can do, what you can, uh, steps you can take to actually put these things in action. Wow. I love the idea of the workbook, but also I love the fact that you are uh, passing on the knowledge because that's what we're supposed to that's what we're supposed to do in this world. We're supposed to get right. the knowledge and we're supposed to pass it on. And that's exactly what yes. you're doing. And your group was actually right because when I read HR is sexy, kill yours. How is HR, HR sexy? They're supposed to be the bad guys. So are they sexy? <laughs> now I need to read this to understand why. <laughs> yes. So I think that everyone else probably feel the same way too. HR is sexy. I need to read this. <laughs> yes. And you know, like I said, it's broken up in sections, so you don't technically have to read the entire book, just what pertains to you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So now I'm also curious with the name, MEND, M-E-N-D. So do you have a meaning behind it? So uh, mentoring, educating, nurturing, and development, developing is the acronym that we came up with. But originally, uh, when I started the business, it was just I wanted to mend companies. Um, I just saw, you know, so much or so many problems and I would say 75% of them stemmed from human resources, um, the issues and, you know, human resources is supposed to be the core of the company. It's supposed to hold and maintain the culture and the core values and the mission. And that wasn't happening. So companies were breaking apart internally and, and you still see it today. So mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to go into companies and mend that and mend those um, issues that are systemic in those companies. Like I, I, that's what my goal is. Um, and that's what we do. Uh, and we see such a massive change when we are um, in a company and we just completely redo their human resources. Retention gets better. Um, leadership gets better. Uh, uh, employee relations get better, lawsuits drop. There's just different trickle down effects that happen when you mend HR and then you mend the organization with HR. Wow. But you also work towards uh, gender diversity and educating about a wage gap. Can you tell us more about how you encouraging companies to take that step? So the first thing is, is I have them review their current pay structure. Like, let's look at your pay structure and why you're paying the way you are. Um, I personally have not experienced a gender pay gap for me personally. But I have witnessed organizations do completely go the opposite direction, where wow. they are literally paying this person more than this person just because it's male and female. I, I've witnessed that and I go in and I'm like, absolutely not. This stops. We need to <laughs> fix this now. 
Like that's, I'm like, this is you, they have the same qualifications. Why aren't they making the same amount of money? Like it makes no different or like, it makes no, no sense to me. No sense. But what I do is educate. I educate companies. There are some times where I feel that it's genuine, a genuine oversight. Like somebody just wasn't paying attention and I'm like, okay, so now you can't do it going forward. You're aware of it. Let's fix it. Let's make it right. Um, and they're like, well, what do we tell the, em- the employee that we're up, that we're right sizing? I was like, you tell them the truth. Don't lie huh. to them about what the issue is. The issue was that you, you did not pay them correctly. Um, you don't know that it was necessarily based on gender, but the appearance is that it was based on gender and you need to fix it. Um, so educating is the biggest piece, uh, most companies. And if I get into a company soon enough, like early enough in their development and growth, we fix that before it even becomes an issue. Um, we set pay scales. We set this is, if you're in this role and you have this much experience, this is what you get paid. And it doesn't matter, uh, what your gender is, what your ethnicity is. This is what you get paid. I loved it. I love that. You also uh, mentor young entrepreneurs. Uh, how do you think women today are open up uh, to being empowered by other women? So I actually, <laughs> I'm putting you in a spot here. I'm putting you in a spot here. Yes, I you know. did. But no, I will say, I will say that um, in my career, I have, I was 30 four before a woman would help me in my career. That's sad. Uh, And I have had more men willing to mentor me and help me grow. And I've actually had more male clients than I have female clients. Yes. um, In my career and in, in my business. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Like I need to be able to, like, I need to help as many people as I can. And so that's why I target women, you know, to provide them. I don't know if it's like, if it's the competition feeling, I don't know if it's the, um, this is my world and my, you need to stay out of it. I don't know what it is. Uh, but for me, I'm like, well, there's enough business for all of us. Yes. Um, let's, I mean, we're looking at 44 million businesses in the United States. I'm like, there is plenty of businesses uh, that we can all share, that we can all work towards. What can I do to help you? And I truly believe what goes around comes around. And if if I'm going to be helpful to somebody, I never know who that person might know someday that they introduce me to mm-hmm. that changes the entire the entire form of my business. And and so empowering women is huge for me is to say you can do this and we're everybody is aware of the economy right now. We're in the midst of a recession and the most millionaires are made during recessions. I would love nothing more than to see women just open businesses, become business owners, become, take that entrepreneur step. We still have a lot of women that are out of the workplace because of COVID. They're the ones that quit their jobs and are at home taking care of the kids. Because if you go back to that gender pay gap issue, the men were making more money. So they're more of the breadwinner. And the women have stayed home and now they're ready to get back in the workforce where there are no jobs for them to go into. So let's build businesses. Let's, let's become, you know, bigger, more, I mean, Rihanna became a billionaire, you know, it's like, there is no reason that, um, that we can't all support each other to become entrepreneurs and empower change. And I know there's an idea in somebody's head that somebody that could help somebody or someone um, in their life make it easier. Exactly. You are talking my language here. So um, I love to support other <laughs> women. And then usually women will tell me I am in a mission impossible. And uh, it's, it's part of this is true. I am in a mission impossible because um, 
not every woman is ready for that to get that support because they are not used to it when you say hey i can help you they look at you like really yeah i'll help you it's okay so i think what you are doing is great and please continue doing it because we need more women to step up and do exactly that we do not need to compete with one another it's not a competition not at all. for me i don't look at it that way at all it's not mm -mm. i don't at all and i'm yeah, like come to not. my office and sit with me <laughs> Come spend a day with me. I'm like, if you want to open an HR consulting firm, okay, ha let's get you started. Okay. So you don't make the mistakes I did. Like, let's do it. Exactly. Exactly. And, and we're supposed to get, the, like I said before, we're supposed to get all that knowledge. We're supposed to pass it on. We're not supposed to just keep it to ourselves because we, if we are doing that, then we're not helping our next generation. And I think that we need to make that step and help other women. It's okay to help one another. So I, like I said, I appreciate what you are doing because it's something close to my heart. So now Thank my you. last question you. for you is, what is your advice to female entrepreneurs that just starting out? They are just starting out. What would you say to them? Don't give up. It's not going to be easy. Uh, you're not going to, you may not be a millionaire overnight. Um, most businesses are not million dollar businesses overnight. There are some that get lucky and run. But generally speaking, if you look at statistics, you're not going to be a million dollar business overnight. Stick with it. Keep going. Take the risk. Step out of your comfort zone. Um, I, and don't be afraid to fire clients and don't be afraid to, <laughs> I love that part. Don't be afraid to lose business for doing the right thing. That is, uh, all we have that we can control is our character and how we handle ourselves. And if, if we're allowing other people to change our character because of how they're acting, it's not going to help anybody else in your organization. Um, so that tough client um, that pays you a lot of money is not worth the headache if you're changing who you are to accommodate that client. So it's definitely hard work. Um, I would always advise if you can get as much capital up front to start your business to do it, <laughs> but it's not impossible. I had zero dollars when I started my company. And, I'm with you in um, that. <laughs> yeah. Like if you can get capital, that's fantastic. Get as much capital as you can to start your business. But if you can't, don't let that stop you. I, in the beginning of my business, I had to take a part-time job to help pay the bills. And once my business took off like crazy, I didn't have to work that part-time job now anymore. And I don't ever plan on working a part-time job again. But you just have to be okay with doing that stuff. Well said. I, I don't have anything to add into it. Thank you so much, Nicole, for taking the time to have this conversation with me. I appreciate your knowledge and passing on to other women. It's, um, it's fabulous. It's, um, it's sexy. I'm going to use your own words again, too. <laughs> it's sexy. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank if you. I, I if I can it. help, I can help. Yeah, is it, thank you so much for having me, and I truly appreciate. I love I love this conversation. Um, having conversation with other female founders is my favorite thing to do, and as leaders, we can always use some guidance and support to keep leading in the best way possible. Thank you, Nicole, for taking the time to have this conversation with me. Let me know your thoughts about this episode with Nicole, and to learn more about Nicole and Mid HR Solutions visit www.medhr.com. Thank you for listening to Female Founders Podcast. That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app or connect with us on womel.com so that you don't miss our next episode. See you next time. Bye for now.